Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinn and I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Reba Lucan. She's the new director of the Allen Centennial Garden here on campus, which is part of the Department of Horticulture in the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. Reba, I'm gonna ask you the five questions. Here we go. Where were you born? Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And where'd you go to high school? Uh, Robinsdale Armstrong High School in Plymouth, Minnesota. In Plymouth, all right. And then uh, where'd you go for your undergrad and what did you study? So you were on the St. Paul campus for the plants and the Minneapolis campus for the religious studies? Yes. Go I and studied abroad in the middle in Ireland. Oh, in Ireland. Where in Ireland? Uh, Cork. Cork. Nice. Southern Ireland. Yes. Oh. Thank you. And then uh, where'd you go for your advanced degrees? Also the University of Minnesota. And I got a PhD in History of Science, Technology, and Medicine with a minor in Museum Studies. Very good. And when did you come to UW-Madison? About a year ago. May 1st is when I started last year. Wow, you're coming up with a one-year anniversary. Yeah, Sunday. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about making a garden for you, especially since that garden is the Allen Centennial Garden. Would you please join me in welcoming Reba Lucan to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Welcome, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. And I put a lovely picture up of the garden. Now, as I heard a little you know, conversation in the background, that's not exactly what it looks like today. Uh, but we do have some flowers up in the garden. Last week, we were waiting with bated breath to see if the tulips would make it up by Saturday, and they did. So we have some orange and yellow tulips, um, crocuses. And if you saw the front page of the State Journal today, we have our uh, magnolia tree is in bloom too. So we're very excited about all of those things as spring maybe finally comes here to Wisconsin. I was laughing, we went to Babcock across the street for lunch today. And I was like, I was here like a month ago eating ice cream outside and today it was 32 degrees. So that was definitely not happening. But hopefully. Summer's over. Summer has happened one day, greatest hit Saturday, moving on to the next season here. Uh, in Wisconsin. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about making a garden for you. And as an overview, I'll talk a little bit first about Allen Centennial Garden. What is it? What do we do there? Where did it come from? And then I'll talk about this making the garden for you part, uh, which comes from the of, by, for all um, theory of making uh, museums and public gardens, and then talk about programs that we have co-created at Allen Centennial Garden, which is the programs of the people, by the people, for the people. So a little bit about the garden. It is a two and a half acre landscape surrounding the Agricultural Dean's Residence on campus here in Madison. Its mission statement is to be an artful living laboratory and public botanical garden for the horticulture department. It serves as an outdoor classroom for UW-Madison students and the surrounding community providing meaningful learning opportunities for visitors of all ages. So there's a lot of learning packed into that statement. And we do that in formal and very informal ways. Um, also of note is this rock garden. It's one of my favorite places to teach in because we have such a rich collection of plants. Um, and they tell a story both of horticulture, but also just survival. So these plants are also some of the things that are in bloom right now because they're used to growing in alpine environments, um, places really high or near the Arctic Circle, where they have a really short growing period. So they have to be ready to go as soon as warm weather arrives, even just a little bit, they flower and start to reproduce and set seed. Now, our garden is located on Ho-Chunk land, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as we think about the plants and the people who are there now. So if we look um, on this map, you can see the western edge of UW-Madison campus. So here's the Lakeshore Nature Preserve coming down this way. 
And the garden is here in this circle. So this is an inset map of the other one over here. And um, this yellow orangish area is a site of archaeological concern where they've noted that um, people in the past lived there. And so that's an archaeological site. Now the garden isn't technically in that site. It's just south of it in the circle. But people don't live in squares, right? So we keep that in mind as we think about what we do in the garden um, and uh, who we're serving and connecting with. Now our name, Allen Centennial Garden, has two parts. The first has to do with the Allens. Ethel Allen and her husband Oscar were both faculty members here at UW-Madison. Um, they loved plants and botany. Uh, they studied plant pathology and in particular legumes. Um, there's a fascinating oral history that you can listen to online from the University Archives of when they were living in Hawaii. Uh, they were there during Pearl Harbor. He was a faculty member. Um, and so there's all of these. All of a sudden, their lab was doing research on water contamination for the Army instead of whatever he was doing beforehand. And then they moved to UW-Madison, where they co-published all of their papers. So Ethel really was a true partner in everything that they did together. The second part of our name is Centennial, and that celebrates the Horticulture Department. So Allen Centennial Garden is a part of uh, the Horticulture Department. And in 1989, when the garden opened, that was the 100th anniversary of the Horticulture Department. So that's where the two parts of our name come from. Um, and we tie those, both of those things into our heritage. This is the garden itself. So like I said, it's about two and a half acres. But we have over 20 different really small gardens packed into what I like to call is a jewel box of a garden. So we try and show as many different styles of horticulture as possible so that students and the public can come and visit and see them in a really small, compact space. People say it's a really good place to take small children and older adults with mobility issues because there's just everything is in a small area. You don't have to walk for miles to see everything that's going on there. And that really helps to connect with people who are interested in different things. So you can see we have a rock garden um, here. Well. All right, the pointer has died. But the rock garden is down here at the southern end of the garden. Um, if you go north a couple blocks, you're on the lake shore if you're trying to orient yourself. Um, we have event lawns and the English garden where we can hold events and different celebrations and all kinds of different things in between. So this is our hand-drawn garden map. And each of those numbers doesn't designate, designate one garden, but many different gardens that are next to each other. So 13 at the top is both a woodland garden and a shady perennial garden. Um, down at the bottom, number four, is the rock garden, like I mentioned earlier. And all of those spaces allow us to do different things. And one of my goals as the director of the garden is to make sure we can tell a story with each of one of those spaces. We do something with them actively. And by we, I mean myself, the director. Uh, we also have uh, a program and event lead who is also now the interim horticulture manager, so the assistant of everything, basically, is what Ryan does now. Um, and then we have some horticulture staff and interns who will be joining us in mid-May to help with horticulture, um, gardening, and also educational programs and photography and design. And all of these students um, are UW-Madison um, students, undergraduates, and they're learning and building skills that will help them um, in the next steps in their career. So this year, we actually happen to have two interns from the horticulture department, but they come from a wide variety of places across campus, not just horticulture. All right, so that's the introduction to the garden. Now, I want to think a little bit more about why we might visit a garden and what might make a garden relevant to you. Uh, why would you want to go there? What would it need to have to make you happy? So when I talk about this, I'm building on some work um, by John Falk. Uh, this book he wrote called Identity and the Museum Visitor Experience. And in it, he talks about five different kinds of museum visitors. And I've been many of these kinds of visitors at different points in my life. But I want you to think for a moment about the last time you went to a public garden or a museum and just put yourself in that picture. Who did you go with? What were your goals when you were there? Why did you choose that place? And then we'll go through and see if we can categorize which kind of visitor you were. 
So here's option number one. Maybe you went to visit because you wanted to relax. You wanted to cleanse your mind and just have a way to um, connect with nature or get away from it all, smell the roses. Um, so we have Bucky over here. You can remember this nice floral uh, montage here. Maybe that was you trying to reflect on your experience. Alternatively, maybe you were with your grandkids or your children and you wanted to show them um, one of your favorite places, keep them entertained, probably not as relaxing of a visit. Um, perhaps this was you, type two. Third option, you were somewhere new you'd never been before. Maybe you took a trip to Chicago or London and you wanted to visit the top 10 most important things there because you'd never been there before and you didn't think you would ever go back. This would be type three. Option number four, maybe you went to the garden because you have an awesome home garden. Maybe you went with your garden club. You wanted to get an idea for what to, tree to plant in your backyard in that one place where you need a new tree or nothing ever grows or you needed to ask somebody a question about those pesky jumping worms or Japanese beetles, um, or maybe you were birding. That's type number four. Uh, type number five, last one. Maybe you read that there was a new exhibit going on in the garden um, or the museum. You had to go to the Chazen to see the beautiful new um, plant banners that are hanging in their lobby. Um, you wanted to see something new you'd never heard before, or just try something new. That's type number five. So at many different times in my life, I've been different categories of these. Um, recharger. Often people who are recharging are going to public gardens or art museums, a place where you can just kind of sit and meditate. You expect some semblance of quiet, usually. Um, and often that's totally incompatible with type number two, which is the facilitator who's trying to make a good experience for somebody else they're bringing along. So when I take my toddler to a museum, I have totally different goals than when I'm there by myself and wanting to just enjoy the artwork, right? I have to make sure that he's happy, he got his snack, he had to go to the bathroom. You have totally different needs in mind um, as compared to when you're there um, as a recharger. Alternatively, an experience seeker as somebody who aspires to be exposed to new things and new ideas um, and what is most important in a culture or a community. So this is like the checklist. This is my sister when we were in the Louvre and she wanted to see, uh, what is the famous painting? in the, the Mona Lisa, right? So what she, we spent 45 minutes in the Louvre. We went right to the Mona Lisa and then we went right back out again. <laughs> now me, I tend to be at least at that point in my life, I was more of the explorer who wanted to read everything in the museum and learn everything. This is not, not compatible with that experience seeker. Um, and then um, type number four is the hobbyist or the professional. So this is somebody who's there to learn more about that particular thing. So there's this joke in the museum community. There's a Twitter account called Dull Museum Snaps. And basically it's photographs that some professional took of a museum that an outsider would think is just something silly. So like, I was in a museum once and I said, can I take a picture of this sign? Because I want to capture how it's the same color as the wall and remember that later, right? Like that was not the point of the museum exhibit at all, but I was really interested in that. Or I'll go to a garden and be like, oh, that path looks really interesting. I'm interested in how that corner got cut off. And that's a totally different experience than when I'm trying to immerse myself in what's happening. So you can see, depending on the day, you might be in multiple different of these categories. And if you're the museum or the garden and you have to appeal to these different people, that's gonna be a challenge. And it requires actually thinking very carefully about what each kind of these um, visitors might want and putting yourself in those shoes. So my former boss would always say, okay, imagine your friends who have small children or imagine your friends who you know, come with a group of young adults and really think about how they would experience the museum and try and capture their perspective. By doing that, you realize that one size does not fit all. And so somehow we have to work within this one institution, this one garden, and make it appeal to all kinds of different people. So one way that I have found um, or related to 
um, do this is through um, something called The Art of Relevance. So this is a book by Nina Simon. And what she says basically are you need to convince your intended audience that, they, that you are relevant. So that means doing something to make them come in, perhaps planning an event that sounds really cool. And then when they get there, you still need to be actually relevant. So when they come, they have to have their needs met. You can't just advertise in Spanish and then have an event that doesn't relate to their culture. Or maybe if they can't find the bathrooms, that's a problem also. <laughs> right? So she talks about doors or keys and rooms. Right? So you need to give them the key to get into the museum, the thing that sparks their interest and makes them want to come. But once they get there, the room has to feel like it's a place they want to be too. So she gives an example of a surfboard. So she worked at the Santa Cruz Museum, and she, they discovered they had one of the original surfboards that people had brought over from Hawaii, and they were demonstrating. Uh, they had found it, and they, this is how they, surfing came to the West Coast. And so they got all of the surfers really excited because they took this, they planned this whole party on the beach, and they took the surfboard out of the box. And Bob Pearson here says, when they took it out of the surfboards, my heart was fluttering. It was just so exciting. Now, I don't surf, so that probably wouldn't have been that exciting for me. I don't think anyone in the museum leadership was all that excited, but this event turned out to bring in hundreds of people, and it really just hit a chord because it was relevant to that audience. Now, Nina went on to start a nonprofit called Of, By, For, All, and there's actually a sticker with that logo on my computer, which I did not put there. My predecessor had this computer and put it on there. Um, but what it means is thinking about planning programs of the community. That means people bring them to you and you help them do what they need. So, for example, we had the succulent club and said, hey, can we use your shed to store our, our plant material? And we're like, yeah, we have room in our shed. Sure, that's your idea. Sounds like a good idea. If you want to use our terrace for your project, that's great too. Um, it might be a project that's by the community. So that means bringing in community members to help plan something that you're both excited about or for a community. So that means thinking specifically about the community's needs when I'm planning an event or a program or designing a garden. So what does that mean in real life? What are some examples of things that have been done at Allen Centennial Garden um, that fit this kind of organization? So every program that brings in an audience is probably hitting some sort of chord or need for the community. So this is a picture, for example, of our summer concert series that brings in a lot of um, local residents from off campus who live in Madison or even as far away as Milwaukee. Uh, people come from over an hour away sometimes uh, to see jazz in the garden on a Sunday evening. One of the tools in our back pocket to make this work really well is our student interns. So because we're in the heart of a college campus, one of the most ready audiences that can and does visit us is students. There are thousands of them that live literally right next door to us. We're right next to the dorms. Um, on the other hand, I meet students who've gone to UW-Madison for four years and have never made it through the gates. Right? So the, pro the project is how to make programs and things that are relevant to students. Well, as it turns out, the interns are a lot better at making programs that students want to go to than the adult staff are. Right? Apparently, a study day in the garden without internet seemed like a good idea at the time, but students didn't really want to go to it. They were much more interested in doing tie-dye workshops, adopting a plant, or even doing swing dancing in the garden. And so we work with our student interns. We empower them to lead and to learn and to make decisions. We try and pay them well enough that they can have this one job for the summer. And we empower them to actually choose what the activities are going to be and invite their peers um, to get involved in the garden. One thing that the student interns came up with um, is welcome week. So this is an opportunity, again, the first or second week that students are on campus, to have them come into the garden. Because what research shows is what students establish a pattern in their first couple weeks of being on campus. So if we can get them to come into the garden right away, they'll come back again, most likely if they have a good first experience. Another program that has been done in the past in the garden is this 
drag queens and daylilies. So we have this partnership with the Wisconsin Daylily Society where we grow daylilies for them in the garden. So that fits their need. They can showcase them for the public. Um, they can, we can grow them for them. But they were kind of just sitting off to the side in this garden bed that wasn't really that exciting or appealing. It looks a lot, I mean, there's many more different kinds of daylilies, but they're relatively familiar. Like in my mom's backyard, we had some. And so what they did was they, they decided to bring in drag queens. And these drag queens actually did a workshop to teach about pollination. So they talked all about how the daylilies were bred um, by taking pollen from one and putting it on another. And they connected these two seemingly disconnected things. And they brought in a really diverse audience of students and adults. They threw a rainbow party that involved all kinds of fun activities um, and really connected to something that I guess the LGBTQ community and others in Madison were interested in, in a way that the summer concert series wasn't reaching the same audience. Now, back to this welcome week idea, something that we've done for many years now is Plant Adoption Day and uh, the Plant Parenthood Initiative. So many students come to college and they're not really sure where they fit in, but they have their own space for the first time. And so some of them are really want to learn how to grow a plant for themselves. And so this initiative is all about giving away free plants. This line had over a thousand students in it to come and get free plants in 2019. Um, and then the goal was to support them to have a successful experience once they took these plants home. So we have all these little cards that are sort of like speed dating little information cards about which plant is right for you. Right, so it says this one needs more care, more consistent watering. This one does better at high light or low light. And surprisingly, one of the key considerations a lot of students have um, is, is it toxic? Will my pet die if I eat it? I was teaching a workshop the other day, and one of them, there was one plant in the selection that said, oh, toxic to pets. Not that all pets eat plants, but this one, you know, was a hazard. And no one picked that one. Everyone steered clear to the other ones, which I thought was really interesting. So this is an opportunity for students to start to learn how to grow plants, to connect to their health and their well-being, um, and to get to know each other um, and the garden. All right, so those are older projects. We're excited to get, hopefully get to do Plant Adoption Day again this year. It had to be on pause because of COVID. We didn't want to gather 1,000 students in the garden all at the same time for understandable reasons for the past few years. Um, but right now we're working on a new project in the Wyman Kitchen Garden. So right behind the Ag Dean's, Re Dean's residence, we have an area where we've grown vegetables for many years. And this year we're partnering with a number of community organizations um, to choose which plants we're going to grow there. Last year we had a bed full of wonderful peppers uh, that w were supplied by a former faculty member of the horticulture department. Um, but people got a little tired of seeing only peppers all summer long. <laughs> so this year we are going to have some really cool peppers. They're called fish peppers. And they were um, harvested and kept by a specific community in Baltimore. Of, um, it was the black community. And they used the peppers to season seafood dishes, which is why they're called fish peppers. Um, but we're going to have a lot of other things too. And hopefully, like we had last year, people will be able to take some of that harvest home with them um, and try it out. So a little more about the different kinds of partners we have and what we'll be growing. So one part of the garden is going to be an indigenous uh, three sisters garden. So like I mentioned earlier, we, we recognize we're on Ho-Chunk land and that there's really a direct connection to uh, former peoples of Wisconsin. And so we'll have beans, and corn and pumpkins all growing in this polyculture, helping each other grow. So the really special thing about this is that the corn stalks provide a place for the beans to grow up instead of having to have a trellis. And then the squash or the pumpkins help to provide a ground cover to keep in the moisture. And these plants help each other grow. Now the seeds that we'll be using are actually coming from um, the Oneida tribe and an indigenous partner that we have through the Native American Center for Health Professions. So since 
2020, right before the pandemic started, they've been asking, hey, can we do a Three Sisters garden in your garden? And it's just now that we're coming out of the pandemic, we can gather, everyone has permission to be around each other unmasked, that we're actually able to do that. And what we're going to do with those plants is not just give them away, but let them use them, um, save the seeds, and um, share the produce with each other and elders and in ways that they find to be useful. So it's really a true partnership. It's not just them giving us seed for us to use, but it's us helping to do the thing that they don't have as much experience in, which is actually taking care of the plants. So I have a crop of interns that can help grow these plants for them, and a garden space too. The next section of the garden is going to be an African diasporic garden that's looking at plants that are grown in the black community, so like the fish peppers and immigrant communities, a lot of which are from West Africa. So here we're working with Yusuf Benrilla, who started the Trade Roots um, nonprofit with a few other folks, and he has particularly recommended this plant here which may be familiar to you. Um, it's known as celosia or coxcomb. This particular variety is called feathery, feathery plume, and it's often grown as an ornamental. But before it flowers, you can actually eat uh, the spinach leaves kind of like spinach. Um, so like a lot of other plants that we don't always eat, namely things like hosta, um, you can actually eat the plant's leaves when they're really young. Um, so that will be growing in amongst the fish peppers, okra, collards, um, some particular kinds of eggplant and tomatoes will all be in that area. And we're not totally sure what's going to happen with this produce yet. Now, Yusuf is both a gardener and a chef, so we're hoping he might make us some delicious food. Um, and he's really big on that, too. He, he came to me and said, are we going to actually eat this food? Because it loses something when you're just growing food and you're looking at it. You really actually have to eat the food. It's an important part of the process. So we're working on that. And then the other section of the garden is going to be a mung garden. So if you go to the farmer's market, you're likely to see a mung grower there, but you might not know um, how important um, mung immigrants are to the overall agricultural system in the upper Midwest, especially Wisconsin and Minnesota. So um, over the past 40 years, mung immigrants have come from West Asia, East, East Asia, East and West, it's very confusing. It's a problem when you're in Madison. East and West, big differences. Southeast Asia for the Yes, Southeast Asia, exactly. Um, and so they, um, many of them went to California, but Minnesota has the second largest population of Hmong immigrants and Wisconsin the third largest in the US. And so we worked with um, someone at Groundswell Conservancy, and she connected with Hmong elders. So I got to go and chat with them. And they told me that the thing that is really quintessentially Hmong, that no one else in Southeast Asia grows, um, are these herbs, which are grown for a specific um, medicinal chicken soup that they give to women after they've given birth. So these herbs are supposed to help with different things that women need, like to help produce milk or recover um, from childbirth. And they also can be eaten by other people at other times. So we're going to be growing these in the garden um, and hopefully sharing them um, with community members who can't grow their own. So like I said, Yusuf was really big about not just growing the plants, but actually doing something with them. And so we're excited to be able to celebrate um, with a harvest festival at the end of the season. So I think it's really important to connect these plants with our life and our survival. It's not only that we have these plants in our garden, and it's cool to grow them, but actually, historically, that was all we relied on to survive. If the plants didn't survive, we didn't survive either, right? Those were essential. There was no grocery store. And I think today, it can be hard to really viscerally understand that because it's just not an experience that, that we're living right now. Um, and so the Harvest Festival is meant to help connect those two dots to bring people in to experience something really exciting. We're going to have a main stage with performers of Hmong traditional music and African traditional dance. Um, of, we'll have a Slavic uh, folk dancing group and um, some other Scandinavian performers to really try and connect um, how exciting it would be to have a really good, bountiful, abundant harvest. And 
maybe what the alternative is um, if we don't have those things. Um, so we're really excited about celebrating that. And we're crossing our fingers and hoping that we get that abundant harvest that we're looking for so we can share it. Another project that we have started to work on is an Islamic garden um, in partnership with the Wisconsin Green Muslims. And somebody asked me, you know, why a Muslim garden? And I said, oh, no, 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 it's not a Muslim garden. It's an Islamic garden. And um, Isla Islam um, has both religious connotations and aspects, but also cultural ones. It's an entire civilization. And um, the gardens that they have in North Africa and southern Spain and Indonesia, all across the Muslim world, have very distinctive styles of architecture. They have this sort of cross, four-segment four path. They often have fountains and long um, troughs of water. And they're just a really important style of architecture that we don't currently have in the garden. We have an English garden and a French garden and an Italian garden, but we'd like to diversify just a little bit. And so uh, we're looking at adding this new Islamic garden. And I like to use this as an example because I was working uh, with the um, president of the Wisconsin Green Muslims, and she said, well, you know, it would be a really good idea to put a prayer niche um, face so people know where to face east when they're doing their prayers. And I was like, oh, yes, that makes total sense. Me, not being a Muslim, would never have thought of that. But by working with this community partner, I can help to design a garden that really fits with um, what they need and what works well for them. And we had these really interesting conversations, too, about how um, right now it's Ramadan, and Ramadan follows the moon cycles, right? So it's a lunar, it's a lunar calendar. Ramadan ends when they get to see the moon, and we have Eid. But what we realized by talking is that Christian Easter also follows a moon cycle. The date of Easter is dependent on when the full moon is. Um, and that was something that they are like, oh, I've been Muslim my whole life following the moon cycle. I'd never heard that before. And so that was a really interesting and enlightening conversation where we could find a common ground as we were talking through that. So those are some examples of ways that we have connected with community groups and thought through what do they need and how can uh, the needs of this community group and the garden intersect and work together. Um, we don't go through that intense process every time, but it is something we keep in the back of our mind as we're planning. And we really try to work with the interns when we're planning for students and to find um, really valuable community partners as we're planning um, for other things in the garden. So I thought I would talk a little bit more about other upcoming activities at Allen Centennial Garden and how they connect to some of the garden spaces that we have. So this is um, a former program here using the event lawn. This event lawn um, is really important to all of our programming that we do um, because it provides us the space. We don't have a lot of brick or hard surfaces, but this is where we have our concert series. If we have weddings in the garden, sometimes they're in this space or the English garden. Um, and so when someone came to us and said, hey, you should really do No Mow May, we were like, that's a great idea, but actually, we use our lawn. It's not just the lawn to look at. This lawn helps to provide us with a space that we can use. And so it's a balance. We don't want to have superfluous lawn everywhere, but it does allow us um, to showcase a way that they're really useful. All right, so before we started, Tom came down and he was talking to me about Family Gardening Day. This is an annual activity that's been on hiatus for a couple years also. Um, May 7th, we'll be hosting Family Gardening Day um, in partnership with a whole bunch of other on-campus partners. So um, we'll have activities for children and adults um, in the garden, free plants to take home. I heard a rumor that there might be free ice cream if you visit all of the stations and get your passport stamped. Um, and other fun things to take home. So in the mail, we got these fun little hammers today. I don't know how long they are, eight inches maybe. Perfect for little hands to work on our flower pounding activity. Um, and we're excited to have sensory bins for little hands. As the mother of a toddler, I get really excited that this activity happens in the morning. It's not during nap time. It's from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. So little people can actually come 
unlike a lot of other things that I discover that would be fun but happen at 1 p.m. and that just doesn't work for us. Um, lunchtime wellness will be starting up again this year um, on May 19th. So every um, Thursday around lunchtime, we have a drop-in activity in the garden. Sometimes it's yoga or meditation. Sometimes it's just ask a master gardener or some music in the garden. We might do origami or make flower crowns, all in an effort to make the garden a welcoming place and just have people come in, right? You can come and have your lunch any day, but you might come the first time because there's also something else happening in the garden. And as we plan this program and other programs, we often partner with other groups on campus. So here is somebody from uh, Reckwell is leading the program. Um, we like to say they're our partner on the other side of the tennis courts. Um, when we did Plan Adoption Day, we partnered with other sustainability groups on campus so they can have a little fair in the garden and students can get to know their programs in addition to ours. And again, here we're using the English garden um, as a space um, and the pergola for some nice shade to do this program. I've mentioned our concert series a couple times. Um, that will be starting on June 12th. It happens on Sunday evenings um, starting at 5 p.m. And again, it's free to the public. The reason why we like to do it on the weekend is because it makes parking a lot easier on campus. So um, that's always the number one issue we have with people coming. They're like, but where do we park? How do we park? The garden is free, but parking is not always free. So that's a challenge we overcome. And it's part of the reason why we try to work with people who are already on campus, um, like students and staff in the summer. New this year, we're gonna be working on a program called Market Science, um, where students will present about their research and engage with the public at the West Side Market and the Hilldale Market on some sun Saturdays in July and August. So this is a way to help students build skills in talking about science uh, with the public. So the goal here is to set up a station that really gets people to engage, to come in, to have a conversation, and to learn something in a fun way. And that's really what we're trying to do overall. But this is a way to expand the knowledge we have among the staff of the garden and share it with students as they think about careers they might want to go into in the future, um, and something we call broader impacts. So a lot of researchers, uh, when they submit a grant to the National Science Foundation, they don't only get funding for their research, but they have to demonstrate some sort of broader impact for the community. And so one way they can do this is by demonstrating, I've done something like this before, I know who the partners are, I can work with the garden, um, and use their resources to talk to the public about some sort of plant-related or non-plant related topic. And then, like I mentioned, we have the Harvest Festival going on. We're very excited to have funding for the Wisconsin Humanities Council. So here I'm integrating a whole bunch of different things. I always like to do things interdisciplinary. Um, so we have some science, we have the harvest, we have horticulture, but we also have the culture we're bringing in. And we're talking about the humanities and how we share all of these different um, harvest related activities. So to conclude, this is a picture um, of the garden at sunset. Again, it's later in the summer, but there's a few key, th few key things happening in this picture that you might not notice at first glance. So on the far right side, we have the, lar the tamarack larch tree. Um, and this larch tree is a very special larch tree. It's called the goth larch um, because it was found somewhere in Wisconsin, and it grows in a very strange way. Instead of just growing up, it's grown out in a really um, wide way. So it used to be tall, but about 10 years ago, there was a big snowstorm that happened about this time of year. Yeah. Um, and the thing about a larch tree is it's a conifer, but it loses its needles in the winter. And so it was not well prepared for this snowstorm because it had already started to leaf out, and so the top fell over. And they thought it was going to die, but it did not. It's still surviving. It just has a more shrubby habit now. So it's only about 10 feet tall, and it spreads across this garden. But it's pretty impressive for a 100-year-old tree that was planted by the first residents of the dean's house. Uh, it was somebody's birthday present. So 
they planted it there in the garden. Um, and it's one of our most iconic and famous trees. Now, this area that we're looking at here um, in the front of the garden is also kind of special because it was um, designed by a student intern. So this area used to be just a, a place for annuals um, in the garden, um, but the students decided, wouldn't it be fun to make furniture out of sod? So they designed this topiary furniture, and they made a room with this hedge, and they built um, these couches. Now, as you might notice in the picture, those no longer exist because not every in intern has a great idea that will last forever. In fact, often they don't because they've never done this before. But it gives them a chance because the best way to learn sometimes is from your failures, right? And so the room remains. It has this lovely little secluded grassy area um, where you can go and enjoy um, the evening. But the intern project, uh, not so much. And then in the foreground, you can see these um, little purple flowers. And they are part of a mixed prairie meadow area. And what we've learned over the years in the garden is it works better to work with the landscape instead of against the landscape. So um, about four years ago now, the other part of this sunny annual garden in the middle of the garden got turned into a prairie. And there were many reasons for that. But one of them was it was really dry and clay soil. So every year they would plant all of these annuals, which were beautiful in this garden, but they'd have to water them every single day. And they always struggled to establish their roots and to, to grow well. And the prairie does not have those challenges. It's a really inviting, well, it's not something you can go in, but as it turns out, it's a really inviting and exciting space for classes to come and visit. It's the number one place that classes in the garden will come to. They'll come and look at the pathogens that grow in the garden. They'll come and look at the insects that grow in, that live and pollinate in the garden. Um, and it's really cool because of the change in elevation. So you can actually stand on that big green event lawn and look down on top of the prairie because you can have a few extra feet of height. And that's not a very normal view um, that you would get in the prairie. And so all of those things come together to make Allen Centennial Garden a place for lots of different people. Um, not every place is right for every person um, on every day. Um, but as we design all of these little spaces, it gives us the opportunity to make a garden that works for you and one that works for you. And maybe your uses are not compatible at all, but we have lots of different spaces. And so it's a great opportunity to bring lots of people into the garden. So there you go. Questions? Yes. Yeah, a few questions. Um, I was going to suggest that as far as finding the directions in the gardens, you can use the sundial because that had. Uh, you can use the sundial uh, that's in the gardens because I think that has an arrow pointing north. So that way you can determine the direction to uh, Mecca. Um, let's see, what else was I going to say? Yeah, uh, you showed at the very beginning of the presentation on that aerial photo, there was something called the Bascom Hill Burial Ground. Does that refer to the two graves that are near the Lincoln statue? And then my other question, uh, do the goldfish, uh, are they, they present all winter in the gardens? Thank you. Excellent. All right, so there was three parts to that question. The first part was about the sundial. Um, yeah, so there's a sundial. I think there's also a compass rose in the garden, and those are good, but they're not exactly in the um, area where the Islamic garden might be. So you'd have to make a stop over there and then sort of adjust and then figure it out. I mean, a lot of people can tell by the sun if you have some experience, but that's just another added feature. The other thing, we were laughing at the sundial. The sundial is not on, uh, it's on standard time, so it's off an hour for most of the year these days. Um, the burial grounds, that um, I'm not totally sure the answer to that question, but I do know that there are um, many on campus. In fact, that this is the highest camp campus concentration anywhere in North America, is what they say. Um, but I don't know that specific um, 
the answer to your specific question with that. And then your last question was about the fish. The fish do live in the pond year round. Um, they're there now. We had an incident two winters ago where the fish did not live in the pond all year round. And so we had to replace the aerator. And the botany garden generously gave us some new fish to resupply our stocks. But they can survive as long as the pond doesn't freeze over. That's the main issue, because they need that oxygen circulation with the water and the air. Okay, quick follow-up. Thanks. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, um, quick follow-up. Um, when you say that uh, this campus has a large number of burial locations, are you referring to uh, Native Americans or, uh, I see, okay, because the Bascom Hill one, I think, relates to two construction workers or something. Uh, yeah, they're very hard to find unless you look for them, but they're right on the top of the hill near the Lincoln statue. Thanks. Online, Dareth asks, just a curiosity question, how many species or cultivars are included in Allen Centennial Garden? That's not something I know off the top of my head, but on our website, we do have a plant finder database that, talks, that shows all of the plants um, that are in the garden and in each specific garden. So you can search by uh, which garden they're in or if you want a plant that's an annual or a perennial that will grow in shade or sun. And as it turns out, people use that way more than I thought they did. We had it down for a couple days because we had to do website updates. And I had like three questions in those two days about how do I get access to this database? How do I find this information? And I was like, OK, people are actually using it. This is good to know. Worth the update and keeping it around. Another question from online, and you'll love this one, as I do. What are the plans for the house in the garden? Uh, so the plans for the house and the plans for the garden are two completely separate things. I'm sorry, they said the house in the garden. Oh. Sorry. All right, in versus and. Important <laughs> distinction. My diction <laughs> was an airy. All right, well, so what I could say, I could talk about plans for the garden for a while, but the plans for the house is not something that I have control over. So, um, right now, facilities is in charge of it, and they're looking for someone to help figure out what to do with it. There was a lot of conversation um, for a couple years, uh, like 2020, 2021, about conference centers turning it into a retreat center. So you may have heard about that project. But right now, that's not moving forward. So they're looking for some different partner to take over and remodel the house. Um, and speaking of the house, um, it was built in the 1890s. So it's over 100 years old. And it was home to the first four deans of the College of Agriculture. Um, and someone lived there until 1980. And then since then, it's been offices and then empty for the past 10 years or so as the university tries to decide what might happen uh, with that building. A question you talked about the soil types. Uh, since this is in, uh, in the urban setting, is that the original soil type, do you think? Or has it, was it changed because this is the middle of the campus? And then do you have constraints as to what you can do as a director? Um, with respect to bringing in soil and, and doing different things in different areas. And, and the second question, how about organic uh, types of uh, approaches to pest control and things? All right, great question. So the first question about the soil. Um, the landscape that's there now is not the same as it was um, when the garden was built or before that. So there was a lot of earth moving. They introduced the pond, which was not there at all. Um, so there's a lot of changes that way. Um, and different parts of the garden have different soil types, um, which happens in a small area, but it's probably more extreme than it would otherwise happen. And then just by having plants there, that changes the soil too. So in the kitchen garden, because there's been so many soil amendments and so many vegetables grown there over, over 30 years, it has an incredibly rich soil. And it's really fantastic for growing things in. They grow really well, um, whereas other parts of the garden have not had the same amendments for growing vegetables, and so they're not quite as rich and fertile. All right, and then your second question, now I have neglect, what is it about? Organic. Organics, yes. So sustainability is something that's been really important to the garden over the past five years especially. Um, and one of the ways that we've addressed that is trying to plant more perennials. So we're using the same plants and letting them return their material to the soil. 
Um, just today, we um, cut down some of the brownery that was left from the fall, and we left it up all winter to provide habitat for native bees um, that nest in stems. Um, we also don't use uh, synthetic chemicals on our lawns. We work with a local organic company that does compost tea and helps to amend our lawns that way. Um, so we do a lot of things like, like that. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Um, what had happened to the, oh, you wouldn't know because you just got here. Never mind. <laughs> um, you mentioned parking, and from my point of view, you've got pretty good parking because, and most people don't realize this, but the parking structure just west of Steenbach Library, I think it's lot 36. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell everybody when is that available, when is it free, when, how much do you have to pay, even if it's on the weekend? I don't know the details about how much you have to pay for the structure. So the structure always is paid because of structure, but surface parking is free after 4.30 p.m. Okay. and on weekends. So there's a lot of lots by the horticulture building, even right across the street on the road, mm -hmm. um, and by Trip Hall, all of that surface parking is free, and that's where people usually park for things like the concert series. So one of the things I ask people to think about when they're saying, oh, it's hard to park on campus, like, yes, it is. Um, but... Uh, I always ask, is it more or less difficult than, say, if you're going to park at the Lake Street ramp, like you're going to the Terrace, or the Francis Street ramp if you're going to the Terrace or to State Street? Mm -hmm. They're not ideal, but they're large, and this is what people are used to. And from that point of view, with Lot 36, if you're willing to pay whatever the hourly rate is, um, you have really good parking availability there. Where it's very close. Yeah. Right. You don't have to walk very far. Now, I want to conjecture about your question. There was one time a statue of a molecule called ATP in the garden. Is that what you're going to ask me about? Yeah. <laughs> Stainless steel. <laughs> so once upon a time on the lawn, there was a molecule, and I forget what its official name was, but it was um, this big s statue that was designed to look like uh, ATP, and not everyone loved it. So it got moved somewhere else on campus. And then maybe somewhere else again on campus. Oh, yeah. We had a history intern last summer, and he was very excited about this story. So I did learn a thing or two about this beautiful statue that was very controversial. It's a, um, it's a very interesting piece of... Modern art. Well, yeah, yeah, and of, of public art and how it gets... It's migratory. We could call it a peregrine. <laughs> Um, great. Well, I think it's wonderful to have um, your space, the other spaces on campus that make this place so welcoming to visitors. Uh, you know, D.C. Smith is a greenhouse is open all year round. Mm -hmm. You're op open all year round, but especially this time of year for the next eight or nine months. Right. Um, can you mention to people about UW Family Gardening Day coming up? Yeah, so return, So in general, we're open every day for free from dawn to dusk. Um, we have a few lights in the garden, but not very many. And Family Gardening Day in particular, like I said, is May 7th. So again, a free event on a Saturday, great for parking. Um, we'll have these little passports that direct you to come to the garden, to go to D.C. Smith Conservatory, which is a beautiful space, like you said. Um, Steenbach Library across the street, and then um, the Energy Institute is participating this year. So if you hit all of those places and get your passport stamped, there's some ice cream for children involved in this activity. Yes, thanks for mentioning all that again, and thanks for mentioning it as part of your talk. Any other questions? There's one in front of you. Oh. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I was going to say you could probably use the sundial to determine exactly when dawn and dusk are for each day of the year. Um, <laughs> and more seriously, I was curious, where was that photo of the Islamic Gardens? Was that from the Alhambra? You know, I, it, I can tell you the answer to that question is no, but I don't know the actual location. So if we go back, I think it says on there. Um, no, I don't know. 
so it's that is not the Alhambra. Okay. Um, it's somewhere else. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much.